Hello everyone. Uh, welcome, I guess, to LDI Off-Road Retreat 2016. I hope you all are having a good time so far. I'm very excited that I get a chance to join you even though I can't be there in person. Benji Matthews asked me if I would take a little bit of time and record a video just talking about some of the things that you're going to be discussing at an introductory level. Now I understand that you are covering an enormous swath of material as you're going to be at that retreat. Everything from I believe the book of Joshua all the way through the poetic literature. And uh, that's a lot of stuff to cover. Um, what I would hope to do is give you a little bit of the things that I have learned in the time uh, that I've been studying this material. I have taught the Old and New Testament sequence in the LDI program about half a dozen times. And so uh, upon each subsequent reading of that material, I learned some new things. And so I'm hoping to kind of give you the highlights of the best of what I've learned. So... Um, let me start by saying uh, I'm not going to delve super deep into any one book. As I understand it, you have a number of people who are going to be doing that for you. So instead, what I want to do is give you essentially the overarching narrative of Scripture up to and through the point where you are at so that hopefully it will give context as you're trying to make sense of each one of the elements that comes up as you're discussing it. So I'm going to give you that overarching narrative. And then also within that, I want to pose some questions that I think are worthy of your consideration in each individual book. Uh, disclaimer, I'm not going to hit every book uh, as we go through this here. But, but again, trying to stay at a really big picture level. So um, let's start with the beginning. Obviously, the story of Genesis, which you've already covered, is a story of creation. It's a story of one God who makes a world that's very good. And as the pinnacle of that very good creation, God makes human beings. Now, God doesn't make these human beings as his slaves to uh, help him get around the work that he has to do. But instead, he makes them as his image bearers, essentially as co-creators in the sense that God makes all things that will then go and make things. And that's uh, what human beings are to do at, at a massive level. So the idea of being an image bearer really is borrowed from the world of pagan idolatry, which was in that time and place, they would have these ceremonies where a carved image, whether wood or stone or metal, uh, they would do a ceremony where that image was sort of imbued with the fullness of God. Uh, of the God, whatever that God happened to be. And then what that thing was there for was to act uh, according to that God's will and that God's purposes for that God's creation. Um, and that's essentially what the Genesis account is getting after. But instead of a carved image of wood or stone or metal, instead of that, it's human creatures who are supposed to be God's image bearers who are there on God's earth that he's made to act according to his will and his purposes for his creation. So that's what it was about. That's why God created human beings, uh, to be that. But obviously we know the story. That didn't go very well. The fall occurs, you know, just a chapter after human beings are created. Um, and what happened in the fall was that humanity chose autonomy. Instead of uh, allowing God to be the one who would always make their decisions on good and evil for them, they stood up and grabbed the ability to make those decisions for themselves. Of course, the problem with that is humanity can't see all things, all times, all places over all creation like God can. And so as they choose what they see as good and evil, it will be inherently flawed. Humanity was never meant to be able to make autonomous moral decisions for themselves. That was always supposed to be something that God did for them. Um, so in doing that, in the fall, in choosing sin instead of choosing righteousness, uh, humanity went on the wrong path. And the result of that was every conceivable relationship was broken. The Obviously, first and foremost, the human-to-God relationship was broken. The human-to-human -human relationship was broken. The human-to-animal relationship was broken. And even the human-to-earth, to the physical creation, was broken. Uh, and it begged the question then, what is God going to do uh, 
about this sin problem in the world. As God sends them out of the garden, as he sends them into exile, it is then upon God to make the decision about what is he going to do next? How is he going to take care of this sin problem in the world? God's answer to that sin problem in the world is covenant, okay? Or setting apart a particular people for himself. This is what is sometimes called election. Now, in that election, in the choosing of Abraham and his family, God promises many things to them. Obviously, God promises them land, which really is the promise that has been most latched onto over the subsequent years since this took place. But the idea of the land was that Israel would be at peace in their own home with God himself ruling over them as king. That's the ideal situation and what the land was always about. They had been uh, ejected from Eden and the idea of the promised land was that it would be sort of a new Eden. So we'll, we'll talk more about that as we go forward. But that's the land. He also promised Abraham a big family, a great name. He promised to bless Abraham. And also, importantly, that Abraham and his children would then be a blessing uh, to the people that they come into contact with. Now, um, there's a huge mistake made by Israel uh, through all subsequent generations that instead of taking the blessing of God that they had been given as sort of fuel for then blessing others, they instead took those blessings and held them into themselves. Um, so that instead of being blessers of others, they, bec they become end users of God's blessings. Now, God never meant that to be the case. That was never what election was about. They were always supposed to be blessed in order to bless others. And I would say basically every category of sin that can be found in the Old Testament can be summarized as God's human creations taking the good things that God has given and using them for self-gratification instead of the blessing of others. And so we're going to see that tension in Israel as we go forward, where this desire for gratifying of the self, for holding in the blessings of God, instead of extending them to others, is always present with them. So the story goes forward in the book of Genesis, and we get to uh, slavery. We get to the Exodus account. Um, in this account, God marks himself out, not just as the creator God, which is important for Israel's self-understanding, but also as the Exodus God, the one who hears the cry of the oppressed and acts with a mighty hand for liberation. Um, but God brings Israel not just out for liberation. He brings them out for relationship, to be in relationship with himself. Um, and this is where the idea of the law comes in. I, I fear that the law is one of the most misunderstood aspects of the Old Testament. Um, but the idea of the law was always because I am God and we are already in relationship. God had already set up this relationship with Israel as far back as Abraham. Because we are in that relationship, this is then how you are supposed to respond to me. The law was always about responding to the reality of a previously existing relationship with God. It was not about obeying certain things so that they could get into relationship with God. Now, understanding that way is hugely important, especially as we get to the New Testament. We start to read about how Paul is talking about the idea of the law and what it was for. So that's the law. They get, they come out of Egypt, they come out of slavery, and there they are on the Sinai plain and they receive the law, which is God's way of saying, now that you are in relationship with me, this is then what it should look like. And so the story of Israel going forward from there, of course, is one not of a positive relationship, not of just lots of good, happy interaction between God and the nation. Instead, it is one of grumbling. It is one of disobedience. It's one of constant unfaithfulness and a lack of trusting in God. It is sin. Okay. Um, and so that really takes us to the point where all of you are going to be picking up today. They're sort of wandering around uh, in the wilderness, and they are preparing for this new generation to arise under the command of Joshua and Caleb that will bring them in to the promised land. So the story about the promised land and getting into it is undeniably a story of conquest. 
And that brings up a number of difficult questions. Um, the, the primary one of these, and the one that I really want all of you to wrestle with as you get into the book of Joshua is, what are we to make of the fact that God commanded his people to commit genocide? Um, I don't think I'm stating that too strongly. God commanded them to destroy all of the inhabitants that were in the promised land at the time. God commanded his people to commit genocide. And it is a difficult question and one that is definitely worthy of wrestling with. Because I guarantee you that people outside the family of faith have already wrestled with that question. And some of them have found God lacking in that. And so if that's not the conclusion we're going to come to, and I don't think it's necessary to come to that conclusion, we have to find a way of talking about this moment in the history of our scriptures in a way that is compelling, that that holds to a good theology of, of the one true almighty God who is both loving and good and just. So I really want all of you to dig into that question of, of what do we do with that idea that God commanded genocide. That's really the big one for the book of Joshua is they come in and they claim the promised land. Then you get into the book of Judges. And Judges is in many ways this this uh, undeniably interesting. I mean, it has some of the most vivid storytelling in all of the Bible. It's undeniably interesting, um, but, but it also is, is hideous in many ways. The theme of the book of Judges is in those days there was no king. And everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And so in the book of Judges, what you're going to see is this progressive downward spiral of Israel further and further into unfaithfulness and futility. Um, and the interesting question that I want all of you to discuss in the midst of this is why have we, over the course of the church's history, felt such a need to make these stories of the judges into hero stories? So, for instance, uh, you're going to take a guy like Samson. And I remember when I was in Sunday school as a kid, I mean, Samson was one that we looked at on the flannel graph. And for those of you who are young in the room, you may not know what a flannel graph is. And you can ask those who are older in the room what all of that was about. But inevitably... A guy like Samson was presented as this hero. He's a big, strong guy, and he killed all these people and, and everything. But a careful reading of the story of Samson, just like a, a careful reading of, of Jephthah or Gideon or many of the other judges, reveals that these were not heroes. It's arguable whether or not they were even good people at all. And Samson, in particular, I don't think was a good person uh, at all. He was much more concerned uh, with his own vindication and vengeance against his enemies and much less concerned with God's will for what God wanted. Um, so I, I want us to focus on that question because I think that this occurs across all of Scripture where we tend to want to make the stories about these figures into hero stories where we sort of put the white hats on them and say, oh, these are the good guys. Um, when in reality, they have a lot of really seedy parts to their lives. And I think that those parts are in scripture because God wants us to give as much attention to those parts as he does to the places where they did well. So the story of Judges is a difficult one. It's in many ways spectacular to read because uh, it does, it comes off as almost a, a live action movie um, in, in the way that the story is told. Um, but at the same time, I mean, it, it is kind of the question of why is this book in the Bible at all? Because there's just so much violence, I mean, senseless, terrible things and futility. So uh, those are some questions to focus in on with the book of Judges. Now, the next thing I'm going to kind of take in a large swath, the books of Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles. And what we have in those books is really a spotlight on three different roles, that of the priests, the prophets, and the kings. So with the priests, we, we finally get to see some somewhat how the priesthood plays out, particularly as it relates to the building of the temple. And I'm not going to focus too much on that, but that's one of the roles. Uh, the next role is, is the role of the prophets. And so big questions here are, what were the prophets like? Uh, what were they supposed to do? And how did that relate to both the monarchy, which is the kings, and also to the temple? Um, 
And, and then if you, we do a good study of that at, that at this point, it will set us up for what's coming later in terms of actually reading the prophetic literature. And I'm excited. I'm hoping to work with all of you more when we get to the prophets. But focusing in on the prophets, I think, is very, very important. So how about the kings? That's the other thing in the midst of these is focusing in on how the monarchy was developed. Uh, and in particular, I think we would be remiss to not go back to the book of Deuteronomy and talk about what God's paradigm is for what the king was supposed to be like. And so I'm going to read this to you. This is taken from Deuteronomy 17, verse 14. It says this, When you enter the land that the Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, Let us set a king over us like all the nations around us, be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among you, your fellow Israelites. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not an Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. So just to summarize there, what they're saying is the king is supposed to be an Israelite. So if there is anyone ruling in Israel that is not an Israelite, this means that not everything is right with the covenant promises of God. That means this king is not what God wanted for his people. The king obviously also, it gets a little bit here to wealth. The idea of accumulating horses is about prestige and wealth. And so God is saying that Israel is not to be concerned with prestige and wealth. Also, the idea that making of these foreign alliances, which is what taking of wives was about, the idea there is to take a foreign wife is not just to take on another marriage, it is also to take on a lot of the religious practices of the nation from which that wife came. God didn't want that for his people. They were always supposed to be a monotheistic people, one God. It continues in verse 18. When he takes the, the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that of the Levitical priests. It is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life, so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees, and not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites and turn from the law to the right or to the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. So this is also hugely important. This is not this, this king is not just supposed to be a man who isn't fascinated with wealth, isn't fascinated with prestige, isn't fascinated with the gods of the other nations. He is a man who is supposed to be wholeheartedly a man of the scriptures. And what is that supposed to do? It's supposed to lead him to humility. He shouldn't consider himself any better than his fellow Israelites. So that is the paradigm of the king. So as we get to the books of Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles, that's this question that hangs over the text is, how do each one of these guys stack up against this paradigm that God has set up for them? So in particular, you look at Saul. Why did God choose Saul to begin with? Especially if you presume a God who has foreknowledge over all things that will happen. Why would God choose a king that he knew was prone, or maybe you would say doomed, to failure? That's what we see in Saul. And then in the choosing of David, uh, what was it about David that made him so special amongst all of Israel's kings? What set him apart from Saul, who had come before him, and Solomon, who came after him? David is unquestionably the paradigm of what a good king of Israel is supposed to look like. Now, even within that, again, I think it's important not to just uniformly set a white hat on David and say, oh, he was uniformly a good guy because he did a lot of terrible things as well. I mean, not the least of which is in the book of 2 Samuel, and it talks about his taking of Bathsheba. Um, that account is worth a, a careful consideration, which again, I don't have time for here. But despite that, why is it that David was sort of God's guy? Why did God see him that way? And then Solomon. Solomon's life is really, in a nutshell, the rise and the fall of Israel as a monarchy. At Solomon's time, Israel was richer than it had ever been. And Solomon starts out his career very well as he asks for wisdom, though he could have had anything in the whole world. 
But then he slowly starts to take incremental steps away from what God wanted. And instead of working to glorify God, you'll even notice in there that Solomon builds a palace for one of his foreign wives before he even finishes God's temple. He makes a house for his wife before he makes a house for the present or the, the presence, the name of God, as it were. Uh, and so we see as Solomon takes on many, many wives and also many porcupines. Sorry, no, I, I had to say that. Um, those who have taken Old Testament with me know that bad jokes is just a part of what I do. And I want to give you the full LDI experience. So Solomon, with all of his wives and all of his porcupines, uh, went astray. Things started to go very badly after that. And what we ultimately have is a divided kingdom. Uh, the, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Basically, Judah versus all the other tribes of Israel. And the direction that story goes, spoiler alert, is that both northern and southern kingdom ultimately go into exile, one at the hands of Assyria and one at the hands of Babylon. Now, we talked a little bit about just how highly they viewed entrance into the promised land. Uh, they thought of it as, in many ways, the new Eden. So to be in that new Eden with God ruling over them, with no foreign king over them, that was, to like in many ways, the culmination of all that God had hoped for God's people. So exile. I mean, it is impossible to overstate the theological significance that exile had for these people. Um, it seemed in exile as if God's dream of setting apart a model people to bring his blessing to the rest of the world had failed. And yet, just as Deuteronomy 28 and 29 promised that exile would happen as a result of unfaithfulness, that was followed by Deuteronomy 30, which promised that if the people returned to God, he would return to them and he would bring them back from all the nations where they had been scattered as a result of their unfaithfulness. And that brings us to the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, where they do have a return from exile, right? Well, yes and no. There's a sense in which they do return, primarily a geographical sense in which they return. But the question is, is this really what God had envisioned when he talks about them being in the land? I would suggest to you that it's not. It is a geographical return, but yet they still have foreign, oppressive, pagan tyrants ruling over them. I mean, everything from the Babylonians uh, to later the Persians, and then ultimately in the time of Jesus, the Romans. This was not what God wanted for them. This was not God's best for them. Um, and so I, I want you to sort of like focus in on that question as you get to Ezra and Nehemiah. In what ways did this mark aspects of the hope that God had for them in the covenant promises that he had made? And where did it fall short? I mean, focus in particularly on Ezra 3 and the people seeing the reconstruction of the temple or what's called the second temple in there. And there's people weeping there. In Haggai 2, it actually talks about that they are weeping because they had seen the former temple in all its glory. And by comparison, this temple was nothing in their own eyes. So there are many ways in which this return was not the full return. That return was still hanging out there. It was an open question that was left to the people. Uh, a question that, frankly, Jesus answered as he showed that he came to bring about the true return from exile. That's a story for a different time. Um, also in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, I think it is beneficial for all of you to focus in on some leadership lessons. As this is the Leadership Development Institute, Nehemiah in particular, contains some spectacular insights into what does good leadership look like. Now, that happens at the beginning of the book. There's lots to learn there. But again, we don't want to do the white hats, black hats thing here because Nehemiah also, if you look in chapter 13, there's a situation where uh, the people of Israel had been taking on foreign wives. And Nehemiah's response to that is to beat them up and pull out their hair. So, I mean, this is not a methodology we would necessarily uh, uh, commend to you that you should do to the people under your leadership, okay? So Nehemiah had both good and bad, but that said, there's lots of leadership lessons to be learned from those books. Okay, 
So getting to the end of it here, I know I think I'm already over the time that uh, Benji had asked me to go. So uh, what are you going to do? Leave? Stop listening to this? Of course not. You're going to sit there and listen. Um, so anyway, let's talk just very briefly about the poetic literature. Um, one of the things that I think is the benefit of the poetic literature, all of it, and there's a lot, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and also, of course, the book of Job, we need to be really honest about the fact that those books contain vastly different perspectives on certain theological issues than you will find in other places, particularly in the Pentateuch. So as an example of that, Deuteronomy um, in chapter 30 basically says, do well and it will go well with you. Choose life and you will have life. I believe Job's response to that is, oh really? Okay, because Job, I mean, it goes over the top to show how well Job was doing, how much he lived in accordance with what God wanted, and yet everything was taken from him, right? And so he is wrestling with that dynamic um, that we sometimes call the problem of evil. For Westerners, because we think that we're all good people, our version of the problem of evil is ultimately, uh, why do bad things happen to good people? like us, right? Their version of the problem of evil ultimately was why do good things continue to happen to bad people? So they wrestle with those questions, right? So Job Job really doesn't see the do well and it will go well with you, although you could argue maybe in an ultimate sense that happens. But even still, the author of Ecclesiastes says, well, doing good ultimately is meaningless. You should try to gain wisdom, but ultimately it's meaningless. Ultimately, uh, it's, it's futility, right? And so that is definitely a different perspective than the author of Deuteronomy had. So there's a tension there. I wouldn't say that there's a contradiction there, but there is certainly a tension there. And those voices of the poetic authors are very important to consider as we go through scripture. Um, yeah, so if there's one thing that the poetic literature has taught me, it's that scripture doesn't always speak with a monolithic voice on a given topic. Um, the literature also gives uh, full voice to a broad array of sentiments not found anywhere else in scripture. Um, and so I think we have to ask the question, uh, how should we alter our interpretive methodology when reading the poetic books? This is uh, the question of what's called hermeneutics, or how do we interpret these scriptures. Are we allowed to simply read them the way that we would the historical books? Or say, for instance, a letter of Paul, can we just read them the same way? Or uh, are we supposed to read them a different way? And if we do read them a different way, sort of what are the guiding uh, forces that should help us out there? I've often drawn this as an example. Uh, the rules to basketball are great if you're playing basketball, but the rules of, of football are different from that, and they're good for football, but if you try to mix them, it can lead to problems. I mean, a football game starts with somebody kicking the ball to the other team. Now, that is not just accepted, it's expected in football, but if you tried that in basketball, if the first thing you did was kick the ball to the other team, you'd get a technical foul. Now, similarly, when you get to scripture, I think that we need to be careful to uh, use a different interpretive methodology for the poetic books than we do with the historical books, than we would do uh, with, uh, with other books, with books of wisdom, with uh, the letters of Paul. Um, the rules to the game are different with those. So that's something important for you to, to discuss. Um, here's an important one. Should the poetry be allowed a voice in forming our theology? Or... Is it simply there to give voice to our, our innermost sentiments? Um, so I hope you understand what I mean by that. Is the poetry basically just there for our edification? Uh, or are we supposed to actually let what we see there form our theology? And if so, how? Um, speaking of which, what are the limitations, if any, on what sentiments we can and should voice to God? Uh, we see the authors of the poetic literature giving full voice to a range of sentiments, everywhere from dark depression in the book of Ecclesiastes, to divine accusation in the book of Job, to graphic sexual desire and depictions in the book of uh, Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. Um, are we allowed to mimic those sentiments, meaning that the poetry serves as a paradigm for our own prayer lives, 
or are they simply there for our own edification and instruction? The, the thing we need to grapple with in the books of wisdom and the books of poetry is what are we supposed to do with these? So as I said, I've already overrun time. And Benji, if you're in the room, my apologies for that. Big surprise, I'm longer winded than I had originally thought. So, But uh, this is your introduction to an awful lot of books. Um, I will be praying for you and hope that you all really enjoy engaging this massive swath of scripture. Have a good weekend, everyone.